I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's streaming only History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're working safely with the skeleton crew from our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. I hope that you'll join us next week for History's Lunch when Ann Ferris Rosen will present a journalist on the front lines of the civil rights movement. Today, we are delighted to have Maddie Codling to discuss the Horn Island Logs of Walter Inglis Anderson, recently reissued by the University Press of Mississippi. Maddie Codling is Director of Collections and Exhibitions at the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. She graduated from the University of Mississippi with a BA in Art History and a BA in Anthropology. She holds an MA in Art History from Florida State University. Maddie will join us via Zoom from Ocean Springs. Please ask questions that you may have for her in the comments of this video, and we'll put them to her at the appropriate time. Now, welcome Maddie Codling. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure to be here with you all. And I am streaming to you from the vault at the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. And today is something really special that we get to talk about because it is the Horn Island logs that have recently been republished. And uh, so the exciting thing about coming to you through Zoom is that I actually get to show you part of the actual logs. So uh, I'm going to put on my handy little gloves here, and we'll start by looking at some of Anderson's actual records from Horn Island. So most of you are probably familiar with Anderson's block prints or his watercolors, uh, but actually these first started in these wonderful little address books and notebooks that uh, he records his uh, explorations in. So let me show you one of those really quickly. So here is an image from the sketchbooks. And I know it was hard to see that one, but it reads, this is already a successful trip. The next one that I wanted to show you is the spiral bound notebook, one of his spiral bound notebooks that Redding Sugg uh, compiled to actually create the Horn Island logs. And as you notice, it is just a regular old composition book. And these were found throughout the cottage and also Shearwater Pottery that we'll talk about a little bit more as we go into the video there. And if any of you are familiar with the Horn Island logs, you know that this is a just treasure trove of record of the life on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And uh, within the logs, there are records of Walter Anderson's day-to-day -day activities, uh, records of what he ate, where he slept, things he was thinking of. Um, and then you even have these really wonderful illustrations that, uh, Reading Sug has matched, matched up with different passages uh, from the Horn Island logs. And I'm just going to read to you a little bit from these logs uh, because it does just show you how uh, deeply Anderson is connecting with the world there. This is labeled the eighth day. I drew man of war birds in the afternoon, tried in vain to get close enough to them. I would draw for a while and then run up and down the beach in front of the row of astonished pelicans to dry off. That's just a little snippet there. Um, we are going to delve in much deeper into the Horn Island logs uh, with this video. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, you can cue the video. Hello, it is a pleasure to be with you all today. My name is Maddie Codling. I am the Director of Collections and Exhibitions for the Walter Anderson Museum of Art in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. Before I get started, I wanted to say a special thank you to the Mississippi Department of Archives and History for inviting me to speak today 
and especially uh, to Dr. Chris Goodwin for organizing this lecture. So it's a pleasure to be with you all and uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you about Walter Anderson and uh, the Horn Island Logs, which have just recently been reprinted. And uh, I wanted to give you a bit of a background about the Horn Island Logs before we get started. And uh, so the Horn Island Logs are really a series of journals that Anderson wrote during the last 15 years of his life as he's going out to Horn Island, which is one of our barrier islands. And uh, upon his death, these journals were actually found throughout his cottage at Shearwater and then also in some of the workrooms at Shearwater. Within them, uh, Anderson records the experience that he had on Horn Island for essentially the last 15 years of his life. And uh, it wasn't until the 1980s that Redding Thug actually compiled these mostly complete logs into what we now have as the Horn Island Logs. And uh, so it is a fantastic read. Um, sometimes it's a little unusual with uh, learning about what he ate that day. Uh, but uh, it's just filled with prose and um, sensitive depictions of the natural world. So uh, many of you are probably familiar with Walter Anderson in some form. His work is probably most associated with the state of Mississippi of any other visual artist. Um, and so you probably are familiar with either his watercolors, such as what is seen on the screen now, or some of his block prints. Um, but we're hoping to take a little bit of a deeper dive and really look at how he is writing about his landscape, particularly Horn Island. And um, so we're also going to take a little bit of a dive into Walter Anderson's relationship with the island. Unfortunately, this presentation uh, will probably do little justice to the logs and really the rich complexity of that relationship. But what I hope to provide you with is more of an understanding of the motivators behind Walter Anderson's voyages out to the island, and also a little context as to relationships between Walter Anderson and Horn Island. So, uh, as many of you are familiar, uh, Walter Anderson is one of the most celebrated artists of Mississippi. And um, so just to begin, I'm going to give you a little context as to his life and really where he's coming from as an artist who is um, who was raised here on the Gulf Coast. So Walter Anderson was born to an illustrious uh, New Orleans family, and he is pictured here with his two brothers, Peter and James McConnell. And the three brothers were really raised by their mother and father to appreciate art, literature, science, history, uh, but also the natural world and really relate to it. So uh, you see the three brothers here. Here's Walter Anderson, the youngest, James McConnell, and the eldest, Peter. Walter Anderson uh, later studied at the New York School of Fine and Applied Arts, now Parsons School for Art and Design, and then later at the Pennsylvania Academy of Art. On the screen is a drawing of a lioness from the zoo, and uh, Walter Anderson actually liked to skip class and go to the zoo where he would study the creatures there and uh, draw and paint them. And uh, these lovely drawings actually won him a scholarship to study abroad in France and Spain. As you see in the image on the screen, even at this young age, Anderson already has a wonderful understanding of structure and musculature, uh, but also that sensitivity that we see later in his watercolors of the creatures of Horn Island. So after his school days in the Northeast, Walter Anderson returns to Ocean Springs to help out in his family's pottery. And here are the three brothers again. Uh, Peter is sitting here on the steps, Walter right behind him, and then James McConnell. And Peter Anderson was the master potter. So he actually formed the vessels and the pottery was really his. Um, 
it began with him and his, his dream to create a pottery here in Ocean Spring. Uh, Walter and James McConnell uh, worked for their brother their whole lives, um, decorating pottery and um, also helping out with the different aspects of the business. So they're pictured here on the front steps of the showroom. And uh, this is a lovely vessel from our permanent collection. And as you can see, it is a double handled uh, vase. And uh, this one is actually decorated by Walter with the image of a blue jay. And something that the brothers were known for was that their pottery really uh, bound the two concepts of functionality and beauty. And so this vase, uh, of course, was crafted by Peter and Walter decorated it, but he's also bringing in these images from the Gulf Coast and such as the blue jay here, which actually accentuates that form of the, um, of the vase. In 1933, Walter Anderson marries Agnes Lucy Grinstead. And uh, here is a charming little picture of them um, as newlyweds. And um, the, the young couple actually moved into a small cottage there at Shearwater. And uh, Sissy actually writes in her memoirs that during these early years, she would read to Walter Anderson from some of their favorite books in the evenings. And uh, so while she's reading, he's actually hooking rugs uh, for their home. And Walter actually created a lot of the furnishings for, for their home. Uh, the image on the screen here is of the Blue Jay table, which gets its names from the Blue Jays carved into the leg. <laughs> and then on the table, on the wall behind the table is actually a uh, tablecloth that Anderson created. And I think those are turns that are flying on the uh, tablecloth there. In 1937, Walter Anderson uh, is diagnosed with severe mental illness. And uh, so he goes through a period of being hospitalized both in Mississippi and also in Maryland. This is a very difficult time for Anderson. And um, we have, we are lucky to have these wonderful images from that time period. Um, the one on your screen is Man in Palmettos. And we believe that the central figure there is depicting Walter Anderson, uh, of course, surrounded by palmettos. And if you've been down to the Gulf Coast, you know that palmettos are kind of a, um, an everywhere plant. Um, they really are literally everywhere down here in the scrub brush um, beneath the pines. But in this image, these have almost become this antagonistic feature. Um, I like to liken them to that BAM image that you see in cartoons where it's, it's coming at, in on the uh, subject here in this work. And uh, I think it shows us a lot about how Walter Anderson is probably feeling at that time period. One of the uh, most engaging stories from Walter Anderson's time in the hospitals is uh, actually reported by his wife. Um, and the story goes that when Walter Anderson is in Whitfield, he decides that he needs to leave. Um, he needs to escape. And so what he does, he takes his bed sheets, he tears them into strips, he creates a rope ladder, and then he repels out the second story window of his room. And uh, so as he is repelling, he actually has a bar of soap with him and he starts swinging from side to side. And he's creating wings on the side of the building. And I like to joke that it was him making flight out of the hospital. Uh, but I also think it shows you uh, really the, the humor that Walter Anderson had, that he was leaving these little uh, clues and hints and, and funny little gotcha moments for the, the nurses that would inevitably go looking for him the next day. So after he has escaped from uh, the hospitals or left the hospitals for the last time, um, Walter Anderson moves with his wife and children into his wife's family home in Gauthier. 
And uh, this is Old Fields, and if you'll see on your screen, uh, this is a photo from around 1965 of Old Fields. Old Fields was a plantation home on the bluff there in Gaucher. And uh, so they moved there to take care of Sissy's father, who was ailing at the time, so that Sissy could take care of him. And uh, during this time period, Walter Anderson is actually the primary caregiver for his children. And uh, this is a time of immense healing and uh, also very prolific for the artist. So uh, during this time, Walter is taking his children on adventures on the beaches and through the woods. He is reading them fairy tales and uh, creating puppet shows for them. And uh, so he is very much inspired by his interactions with his children. And uh, he actually turns the upstairs attic, you can see the windows here, into his studio. And that's where he's creating these large scale linoleum blocks, uh, which we're probably most familiar with. Uh, and he does this around 1945. And he's creating about 300 of these large scale linoleum blocks. He's also illustrating some of his favorite works of literature, such as the Iliad and the Odyssey. He is creating calendar drawings uh, that depict uh, a single day, each day for three years, uh, just an immense amount of work that is coming out from this time period. In, uh, in 1947, Walter Anderson and his wife separate and they move back to Ocean Springs. Walter goes to the little cottage uh, that he and Sissy once shared, and Sissy and the children actually move in with Walter's mother into the larger home on the property. And here is a watercolor of the cottage uh, from this time period. And uh, you can see that Walter Anderson has really allowed the underbrush to grow up around his little cottage there. So he begins to recede more and more from his family and from the uh, normal life uh, that most people are expecting of him. So he recedes into uh, his house and um, the little room, which uh, if you've been to the museum, you know that it's uh, one of our crown jewels here at the museum is the little room and uh, it's, 24 hours of a Gulf Coast day uh, that is depicted in murals on all four walls and then crowned with a giant zinnia on the ceiling. So he, he received more and more uh, away from society. And then he also starts making these journeys out to Horn Island. And again, it's on Horn Island that Anderson starts to find healing and solace and uh, finds this really communion with nature. He would set out in his boat in all types of weather, rowing up to 12 miles to reach the island. Anderson made his final voyage to Horn Island in 1965 and uh, upon returning home he asked his wife Sissy to take him to the hospital. He locked the door to his little room and he never returned. The other character in this uh, relationship, I guess you'd call it, is uh, of course Horn Island. And so as you see in this illustration of the Mississippi Sound, here's Horn Island just off the coast there, uh, about 12 miles from Ocean Springs. And Horn Island is part of the Barrier Island complex here that actually forms the Mississippi Sound. And the Mississippi Sound is the space between the, the barrier islands and then the mainland of the, the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. Horn Island is approximately seven miles long and it's not even a mile long at its widest. Uh, the island has gone through several periods of uh, minor habitation. This is a lighthouse. Uh, from, taken around 1900. And uh, the family here is actually the Johnsons who were the lighthouse keepers. And um, so they lived there till about 1906 
when a storm swept away everything off of the island, including the lighthouse and uh, the keeper and his family. Uh, later, there was a farm established on the island that raised cattle and pigs until about the 1920s. And actually some of those pigs were still around when Walter Anderson was uh, traversing the island. Um, and they actually showed him where he could find water, fresh water. In the 1940s, the US Army used the island as a base for testing biological weapons and incinerating captured enemy weaponry. But of course, our uh, most well-known inhabitant of the island was Walter Anderson. The artist, he really sought the company of nature above the bustle of the mainland and found solace and healing in the wild windswept barrier island. This image uh, I'm told is from Christmas day, one year in the 1960s. And if you notice, Anderson is in a parka. So I imagine it is quite cold out but he is still barefoot as he's sailing out to Horn Island there, uh, really showing you the connection that he needed to feel with this environment. So Anderson was really seeking to escape what he called the dominant mode of the shore. And uh, of course we, we can associate that with work, family, um, society pressures, and uh, to really guide us into this discussion, I'd like to read you a poem written by Anderson. It reads, leave the land to the beasts that toil, leave the land to the men of the soil, leave the tree and dance with me over the deep and dark blue sea. I can't, said the leaf, I'm tied to the tree. I love that little poem because it does show you so much about Anderson's sense of humor, but then also the, uh, the need to escape. And I think for many of us, the idea of just dropping everything and escaping to an island wilderness has a certain romantic allure to it. The shrugging off of daily responsibilities, customs, pressures of everyday life sounds almost luxurious. However, the story of Walter Anderson seems almost like one of fantasy, something that we might indulge in every once in a while, but never commit to fully. However, for Walter Anderson, the last 15 years of his life were devoted to Horn Island and its preserved wilderness. He refers to the islands in his logs as his love afar. So uh, again, this is the, the cottage on Shearwater property. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, Walter Anderson starts to remove himself from uh, society, from his family during the 1940s, the late 1940s. He lives separately from his wife and children. And um, he both emotionally and physically begins to block access to himself. He even allows the brush and um, natural world to grow up around his little cottage, creating kind of a natural buffer between himself and the rest of his family that were also working on the compound. And you can see that in this image here, uh, where you're actually looking through all of this underbrush to the little cottage. Um, this is an interesting aspect of Walter Anderson's uh, manipulation of his landscape. So he actually uh, grew these wonderful Cherokee roses uh, over the arbor in front of his house and he actually let them kind of go wild. So he is physically blocking anyone who is attempting to come through to his little cottage. And uh, I kind of think of this along the lines of our fairy tale princes, uh, particularly the prince from Beauty and the Beast. And um, you, if you remember, uh, the beast actually grows these wonderful roses all over his castle uh, to prevent people from reaching him as kind of like a natural barrier. So Walter Anderson, uh, he grows his own roses. And if you notice, this is a block print from 1945. Um, that illustrates Beauty and the Beast. 
and Anderson has included the beast down here at the bottom and then growing next to him is a Cherokee rose. So he is already making these connections between himself and these literary figures. Uh, so he, Walter Anderson is going out to the islands um, for weeks at a time. And then when he returns, he is returning uh, really for specific purposes. So uh, supplies, and then also to decorate pottery for his brother's business at Shearwater. Uh, and again, he worked there his whole life, um, earning about $10 an hour, excuse me, not an hour, a week. The family rarely saw him during this time and it was largely in passing. The Anderson children remember being slightly embarrassed of their eccentric father and wishing that he would be something normal, like a postal worker or a grocer, anything but an artist. And so Anderson let them be. And he escaped to his island 12 miles off the shore. For Walter Anderson, Foreign Island became a kind of mythological place. And that's something that I want us to, to explore now is really the mythological aspect of the island and how Anderson is tying it to these great works of literature, folklore, and also, also mythology. So he writes the following about an, his approach to the island. Quote, the clouds in the direction of the island formed a sort of illuminated ladder, small end on the island, which was most appropriate, only celestial beings able to reach it. Providence made an exception in my case, and the island was lowered back to the horizon. As we see in this passage, Anderson applied this common literary trope of the floating island to Horn Island. This establishes it as working along the same lines of the islands found in works such as Gulliver's Travels and Homer's Odyssey. Anderson was an avid reader especially of those works that were about voyage and exploration. He even went so far as to create illustrations of his favorite works, such as The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, Darwin's Adventures of the Beagle, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and Don Quixote. And these are not just one or two illustrations of each of these works. These are about 200 illustrations per work. Um, and these are only a few examples. For Walter Anderson, Horn Island became this fantastical place where he was able to live out his own adventure, mirroring these literary heroes. Even in his description of the island, he has loaded it with literary imagery. He wrote, he wrote in his Horn Island logs, such sky, such water, and Horn Island between with me walking it, the back of Moby Dick, the white whale, the magic carpet, surrounded by inhabited space, strange inhabited space, end quote. Much like these literary heroes of fiction, Anderson saw the effort that it took to reach Horn Island to be a crucial part of the experience. Anderson would often row out the grueling 12 miles of open water between Ocean Springs and Horn Island. Local legend states that the family once gifted him with a motor for the back of the skiff. And so Anderson, in turn, he rows out to where the bay is deep enough and he unhooks his motor chucks it into the Mississippi Sound, and then keeps rowing. The physical exertion was a necessary part of the process. It was as though the journey was a trial tasked by the gods that he must complete before he could reach his paradise. And here is a passage from the logs where Anderson writes about his approach to the island one blustery day in 1950. Ah, Psyche, I have felt thy aid. Here in place, I have hesitated to give thee credit for anything but thy aid in dancing. But there, in the conditional state of being, where even nature was uncertain of my needs, 
I heard the voice of the princess, cast all adrift and trust to thy present condition. Thou hast no enemy. What did I then? O oh, shame, I trusted to my hands and not to thee. They became like hooks and grasped the oars in an imperishable grip. In this passage, Anderson cites Psyche, the got Greek goddess of the soul, as his aid as he struggles to reach the island, moving alongside the artist as he rows the waves. And again, here's another linoleum block print uh, depicting this mythological uh, being. So here is Psyche, and she holds aloft her candle, which becomes the emblem of the soul. And then next to her is Cupid, um, no longer the cherub that we probably associate him with, but instead he's become this kind of coastal raptor with these uh, very powerful wings, a hooked beak and claws. Through his citation of the great works of literature and mythology in connection to Horn Island, Walter Anderson actually crafts an ideological connection between myth and the physical island. These connections give us a glimpse into Anderson's approach of the island as one that is both new and exciting, but also ancient and connected to a larger story of humanity. So now I'd like to talk with you a little bit about the spiritual connections that Anderson found on Horn Island. On the island, nature uh, the awesome, majestic power of nature was something that Anderson got to experience without a filter. The island's moods, her temper, her gentle touch, and her raging storms, these were all part of what Anderson called the divine symphony. The weather creatures and the manner in which Anderson was able to interact with them was something akin to religious worship. As portrayed in his logs and his artwork, Anderson interacts with Horn Island in much a spiritual way as it is even artistic or observational. One example that I'd like to cite is uh, his passage from the logs. It's just a short passage. He writes, quote, I am under my boat. Overhead, the thunder is rolling. Holy, 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 end quote. Here, Anderson employs the well-known hymn to the creator penned by Reginald Herbert in 1826. One verse of the hymn reads, quote, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea, end quote. As Anderson rests beneath his boat with the thunder rolling overhead, he equates this experience with nature actively praising God. The awesome power of nature calling out to his creator and Anderson is there to translate. Walter Anderson also sought out creatures as these kinds of spiritual conduits. He writes, dogs, cats, and birds are the holes to heaven through which many may pass. Therefore, through interaction with these creatures, Anderson saw his existence as moving beyond the physical and into the spiritual. His depictions of creatures are raw and sensitive. Snapshots of time where the artist comes face to face with wild animals and at once the divine. And particularly in works such as this one where Anderson has really removed the, um, the barrier between the observer and the subject. Um, for instance, look how the green heron in this work is staring out directly at the viewer, uh, which in this example, of course, is Walter Anderson. He makes it an immediate connection, almost like what you would associate with a, an encounter with a wild animal um, in the underbrush or in the woods. And it's that split second when you see each other and you make that connection right before they flee away into the underbrush. But Anderson seems to capture that, that aspect, that moment, and it's frozen in time. You can actually feel the, the trepidation, excuse me, 
uh, and the fear behind this little creature as he is uh, caught in the artist's gaze. Even Anderson's depictions of dead creatures on Horn Island are painted with reverence of religious reliquaries. For example, in this painting of a dead pelican, the artist has painted him with delicate and very deliberate brushstrokes. He fills the page with the image of this dead bird. During this period, Anderson would create hundreds of watercolors and drawings of dead creatures, paying respect to their lives through recording their broken bodies. This I equate much like the uh, tradition of reliquaries as seen in the Roman Catholic tradition where pieces of the saints are actually preserved um, much like Anderson has preserved these uh, physical bodies of these dead creatures. In his appreciation of living creatures, he found a picture of humanity's connection to nature writing, quite, quote, the bird flies and in that fraction of a fraction of a second, man and the bird are real. He is not only king, he is man. And he is not only man, but he is the only man. And that is the only bird. And every feather, every mark, every part of the pattern of its feathers is real. And he, man, exists. And he is almost as wonderful as the thing he sees. End quote. It was as though Anderson's experience on Horn Island was a spiritual journey, connecting him closer and closer to a complete understanding of humanity through its relation to nature. John Anderson, Walter's youngest son, states that his father got very close to what he was looking for at the end of his life, that complete connection to the natural world something that he called realization. The biographer Redding Sugg reminds us in his preface to the Horn Island Log that it is not a human realization, but a natural realization. Nature working in tandem with humans to realize her true self. A great example of that is uh, the following quote, which states, quote, for why does man live? To be a justification to the little black and white ducks, to appreciate the great cumulus clouds and to judge between winter and summer, which will win the yearly war of the ellipse, to laugh and give reason to the love affair of the birds, himself vile and they still happy in that first garden, to count the stars and keep them in their places. To be a servant and a slave of all the elements. The Horn Island logs are incredibly rich in their content, imagery, and a, a historical record. These logs reflect and relate to the great works of fiction, mythology, and even spirituality. In reading an account of one day one hour, the reader is actually transported 70 years into the past to the base of a pine tree or the seat of a leaky green skiff. The Horn Island logs provide us not only with a snapshot of time, but with a glimpse back to the core of our own humanity, one defined by the natural world and our connection to it. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. That was great. All right. Here we are. We have questions, um, and a, a few of them from here. I wonder if we, if we could talk just a few minutes about Horn Island, the Barrier Islands. How is Horn different from Ship Island, some of the other barrier islands off the Mississippi coast, and how did it come to be the one that Walter Anderson chose? Well, I think the first thing is accessibility. So actually, he began by going to the Chandelure Islands off the coast of Louisiana, 
um, because he did start his travels to the island in the 1940s. And of course, during that time period, uh, Horn Island was a base for the army. So uh, he actually did get captured one time. Um, it is recorded in the log. Right. He writes about it. He said he was terrified. <laughs> and uh, he actually capsizes off the boat and uh, is captured by the U.S. Army. They think he's an enemy spy. Everything gets worked out. But uh, so he does decide to go to the Chandelure Islands until they vacate the island of Horn. Um, but then later he does go to Horn Island. And uh, again, it is closer than the other islands. Uh, but it's also this um, preserved wilderness experience that he was looking for. So Ship Island, um, it's had ferries going out to it. Um, and you know, it's, there's a lot more traffic to it. Horn Island was kind of this isolated wilderness space, which is really what Anderson was looking for. Yeah, Sugg compares Anderson's trips to Horn to Thoreau's experiences, but he notes that Walter Anderson's cabin was more like Thoreau's Walden, and that when Anderson actually went out to Horn Island, it was a, a big step beyond the Walden experience. I mean, how primeval exactly was Walter Anderson trying to, you know, how primeval an experience was he trying to have? He was looking to shrug off every aspect of his um, responsibilities and also uh, the the constraints of the main world. Um, so on Horn Island, uh, Redding Sugg actually refers to him as Adam in a hat. And uh, at first I thought of that as, well, he, you know, was going back to this uh, ideal of man and the nature and then... Um, John Anderson, Walter's youngest son, actually said, no, it's because he walked around naked with a hat on. Um, so he was totally um, removing himself from these constraints of the mainland. Uh, he would actually flip his boat upside down and sleep underneath the boat. And he had a whole plethora of different ways of making it very comfortable. Um, he is He goes out there with his uh, supplies in big metal trash cans. Uh, he did actually take his food with him, uh, and those would be, of course, in your tin cans. Um, and so he would have what he'd call a mystery feast, uh, where he would take one of the tin cans that has something in it. He didn't know what it was because the label slid off when it got wet on the journey over. Uh, and then he'd open that up and have whatever it was. He talks about having spinach soup a lot uh, for dinner. So um, quite quite an experience, but I think that was really, that was the whole point of it, um, was that he didn't want to interact with humans on the island. And in fact, he, he talks about seeing people, you know, on their boats, or they would try and talk with him. And he just really wasn't interested in that. Like he had plenty of company uh, with the natural world and the creatures there. And the hat served double duty uh, oh, as a duty. as a net Absolutely. to 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 <laughs> snatch up small creatures to be drawn as needed. It's a Absolutely. handy item. He'd also keep uh, his art supplies in the top of his hat because sometimes he'd have to wade through lagoons or marshes to get to a particular plant or creature that he'd like to paint. And so to keep his paper dry, he just stuck it on the top of his hat and wade through the marshes. Walter Anderson, in his logs, seems to know the names of so many plants and animals. How did he come to be so well-schooled in natural science and natural history? Well, he had grown up with it. Uh, so his father was constantly taking the boys out into nature. Um, they were, he was also a great hunter, so uh, you know he was constantly engaging them with the natural world. Uh, but then also, Walter Anderson uh, was constantly seeking to learn. Uh, he had a vast library in his tiny little cottage that we found. Um, but then he is also, uh, he would talk with the scientists that were stationed here on the Gulf Coast during that time period. He had a really wonderful relationship with them. And uh, so if he found something that he didn't know about, he would go and talk with them about it. Uh, so he was seeking constantly. He was seeking to understand the world. Um, and then he also had this really wonderful 
sense of curiosity, um, almost a childlike curiosity where everything was new and wonderful and he just wanted to learn. Yeah. He left so much behind when he would go out to Horn. Did he take any sort of scientific instruments, anything just like a binoculars or magnifying glasses, or did he do it all with just what was built in? So he did actually take a magnifying glass. Um, we have that recorded in the log. I don't know about binoculars. Um, that would be interesting to know. Uh, but otherwise, I think most of his, his um, supplies were actually quite primitive. Um, he was he would actually create his own brushes and um, different instruments. Um, he would also, you know, make do with what he had. And uh, so he's really, he, was, he didn't take a lot with him because you couldn't fit too much on a tiny green skiff. And for him, the drawings and the paintings were part of the experience, but not the end goal. Absolutely. So the paintings and drawings had at that time become a way for him to connect with the natural world. Uh, so we really look at these periods of his life as starting as a uh, any art student would, where the artwork is the main goal. That is your end product. That is what you are selling. Um, and so he begins, you know, as most do in their art careers. And then he goes to China, actually, in the in 1949. And uh, while he's in China, his perspective changes, and it is no longer art for uh, the purpose of production, but art for the purpose of creation. And uh, so artwork actually becomes this mode for him to connect to the natural world and really find this spiritual understanding of the subject that he is um, painting, drawing, writing about. And uh, actually on Horn Island, Walter would use a used piece of paper, so something that already had a watercolor or a drawing on it, uh, to start his fires uh, hmm. on the island. So he valued that blank sheet of paper much more than something that had already been used because, again, creation was the main goal. I, I love how in the book, Sug refers to the art at one point as stigmata, which mm -hmm. I mean, it really seems exactly right in some ways. We have a few questions from viewers. Deirdre Payne asks, did Walter Anderson exhibit any mental illness prior to 1937? If so, how did it present itself and how was it handled? That's actually a very interesting uh, question because we know so little about Anderson's mental illness. Uh, to my knowledge, it really uh, came about most especially in 1937. He went through a series of uh, difficulties. His uh, an aunt he was very close to passed away. Then his father passed away. He uh, lost a major commission. Um, and then, of course, this is also in the 1930s. So you have the Great Depression. And uh, so Anderson really goes, oh, and then he's also sick. He has malaria twice during this time period. Uh, so there's a lot of different factors that are going into it. Uh, but really 1937 is what we have reported as um, really the breaking point, unfortunately. Um, and uh, it's, it's something that I don't think he's ever fully healed from. Um, this is something that he struggles with throughout his life and really that was a motivating factor for going to Horn Island because he was able to find that healing and that solace. And uh, it's very interesting. There's been so much study and research about the natural environment and its effect on our mental state, um, especially in the last 10 years. And uh, so he is actually finding uh, that relief through the natural environment and through being in such close proximity to nature. Have you been to Horn Island? I have. I have been to Horn Island, and uh, it is wonderful. We, I have the great opportunity to go with the museum several times. Um, and uh, one time I did stay several nights, um, and I'm not a camper, 
but I loved it. It was uh, absolutely magical. Uh, you understand Anderson's work on such a deeper level after you are able to wake up with the sunrise and you're having your coffee on the beach and all of a sudden you start to hear some commotion out in the water and you see the dolphins corralling fish mm. and then the pelicans starting their dive in. So there, it's really what Anderson called it was the divine symphony. And uh, I can't think of a better term for it because it is, it's nature working together and uh, you're really just there as the observer. Mm. Um, you're not there to take part, you're there to watch and to learn. Jeff Narvel asks, will the museum be rescheduling the expedition to Horn that was canceled in March of 2020? We hope so. We hope we will be able to reschedule um, another expedition out there to the island. Nothing is on our calendar yet, uh, but I will make a note that there have been questions about it because I want to go back out there too. Yeah. So you mentioned that Walter Anderson had a role with the family business at Shearwater really to the end. Um, what all was he doing for them? Yeah, so he is actually the, the primary decorator uh, along with his brother, Mac. Um, and Walter, um, he didn't have another job other than this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so he decorated pottery for uh, his brother, Peter, uh, throughout his life. And so he was... was decorating pottery there um and mostly uh it was like pulling teeth is what i've heard <laughs> is that uh walter would go over to the workshop and he'd pick out the the pieces that he wanted to decorate and then he'd take them back to his cottage where he'd work um but sometimes uh he wasn't decorating fast enough for uh peter how he wanted to have them producing and so sometimes peter would take a piece that was supposed to be decorated and he just dunk it in a single color and call it good to go. So <laughs> <laughs> how did Walter Anderson fit in with other Gulf Coast artists? I mean, did he know George Orr or his work? Did he know Dusty Bonger? Did they know him? There's especially such a cool connection between uh, the Andersons, really all of the Andersons, and really these major artists on the Gulf Coast during this time period. So uh, George Orr was a little bit before uh, the time when the Andersons were in Ocean Springs, but uh, actually Peter Anderson's first kick wheel had been George Orr's. And that was, uh, they actually got that at an auction. And so that was his first kick wheel as he's learning the trade of pottery. How about that? And then Walter Anderson was actually best man at Dusty Bonger's wedding. And uh, he and Archie Bonjay were at school together in the Northeast and uh, became fast friends. And uh, so he and the Bonjays had a really wonderful uh, connection and friendship. And actually, there are objects from Anderson's home, uh, such as a sea turtle skull, that we see show up in Dusty Bonjay's still lives and oil paintings. Uh, so you can really see that connection. There's actually a plate in our collection that Bonjay uh, decorated uh, at Shearwater. And uh, so definitely a deep connection between the, the families here on the Gulf Coast. Um, also a connection with New Orleans artists such as uh, William and Ellsworth Woodward. Um, so really everybody kind of knew each other. Uh, artists have a way of doing that. <laughs> Are, are there any descriptions of Walter Anderson's physical act of painting by observers? I mean, he must have been pretty fast. Did he sketch and rework? Did he ever use photographs? I guess he didn't in the field, but how, he, how, how could he produce what he did under those conditions? Yeah, he is doing all of this from observation. And uh, I like to, to especially take children's groups through the museum and talk with them about the level of detail that Anderson is able to give certain creatures. So uh, if you remember to the video there, um, the dead creature, uh, the pelican, the, the painting of the dead pelican there is much more detailed 
and uh, oriented to specificity. Whereas something as like the uh, blue geese or something that's flying, he just is able to do just really quick little, uh, little sketches almost through the paint. Uh, but one of my favorite uh, stories about Anderson actually creating is from his daughter, Mary. And this is during his time at Oldfield. So he, it, she said that he would sit down and uh, have his ink bottle beside him. And she was fascinated, of course, as, as a little a little toddler seeing her father, you know, drawing in, in her front yard. And so he would tell her she could sit there and watch him as long as she was quiet. Hmm. And so she said he would just dip his pen and it was like he knew every curve and every stroke, how the lines and movement were supposed to work. And uh, she said it was like he, he was dancing on the page with his pen. Wow. We have another question from viewer. Uh, Wilson McDuff asks, are you familiar with Anderson's Horn Island encounter with Fairhope artist Craig Sheldon? I am not. That is interesting. I, I don't know anything about Craig, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, Wilson, tell us more about it. <laughs> it, so Anderson wanted to experience everything out on Horn, and that included the hurricanes that sometimes came through. He stayed out there for a hurricane. Was it Betsy? Betsy, yes. Uh, so, and that is actually included in the logs as well. Um, quite an interesting uh, description of it as well, because Anderson just has such a Oh yeah, I was out there for a hurricane, kind of non-committal <laughs> uh, reaction to it. But actually his family asked the National Guard to go out and get him because they saw the weather coming in. They knew it was going to be a bad one. And so the National Guard goes out there and they say, you know, come on, you got to get on the boat. We got to go. And he turns his back on them and goes further into the woods. <laughs> and uh, he talks about it in the log. He, he records it. Um, but he also talks about it as like this most perfect storm, just a beautiful storm that he wanted to experience. So he, uh, he actually proceeds to Firth to higher ground, um, pulls his boat up there with him and, uh, ties himself to a tree. And really that's all that he gives us. Uh, he then actually records how the storm changed the island. Um, and that's very interesting because he is looking at the way that the storm actually just like cut the island and um, was violent. Uh, but he's also recording it in this way that's almost uh, devotional, um, something that he is celebrating the, you know, really the trauma that the hurricane had on the island, but how change was creeping back even right after the storm. Uh, just really interesting Anderson's relationship to this kind of terrifying power of nature. And one of the sad codas to the story is that uh, decades later, I guess Hurricane Katrina managed to damage and even destroy some of Anderson's work. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we are not sure how much work was actually damaged, um, and it, you know, it was a it was a really difficult time for everyone. Not not even just the family, but um, I think it was also really amazing to see the outpouring of support from the community, from the neighboring state. Um, people came in from all over offering aid and uh, marching through the marshes to find watercolors that had been blown into trees and uh, were buried in mud and all kinds of things. And I think that Anderson actually would have really enjoyed it <laughs> because it was showing that camaraderie and that human spirit um, and that his watercolors were able to bring all these different people together. Um, but really, really just a, a, an amazing story of um, not being kept down um, and coming back from really the point of destruction. Yeah. 
We have come to the top of another hour, but I, I wish you would say a few words about the Walter Anderson Museum of Art, when we can visit, and uh, anything that you may have planned or hope yeah. to have in the way of excursions to Horn Island. Well, uh, we are actually, this is our 30th year of the Walter Anderson Museum of Art, hmm. and uh, we are opening a new exhibition called The South's Most Elusive Artist, uh, featuring Anderson and his way of breaking the mold as an artist. And the opening reception for that is on May 1st. And uh, you can visit us uh, all seven days in the week. We are open uh, from 11 to 5, uh, Monday through Saturday, and then from Sunday from 1 to 5. Um, but we are really excited to be able to open up our creative complex across the street. Mm -hmm. This is a renovated 1800s building uh, that has, gonna, has been completely renovated to house our educational uh, programs. And so we are really thrilled to be able to have that and to really expand our programming um, including science and industry, connecting it to the art of Walter Anderson. It's a beautiful place. Uh, if, if folks haven't been, it's, it's high on the list of, of spots they ought to visit in Mississippi. Uh, our thanks to our friends at University Press of Mississippi for reissuing the Horn Island Logs. And thank you, Maddie Codling, for being with us today. We look forward to more with you in the future. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.